Amen, amen, amen. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. Wow, it is so good to be with you all this morning. Whether you're here with us in person or joining us on the live stream, it is so good to be with you. And I tell you what, you know, I've been here for about a month and a half, 
And I just want to say, nothing excites my soul more than to be with you here this morning, to come together on a Sunday morning and worship the name of Jesus together as the local church. It is so great to be with you here this morning. Awesome. Pastor Jerry. Um, I agree with you. You're a month and a half, 33 years, and I'm excited to be here every year, every Sunday too. In Psalms 46, it says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, the mountains fall, the heart of the sea into the heart of the sea, though in its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose stream Make glad the city of God. Have you come to worship Him? Let's celebrate Him this morning. Standing here in your presence, thinking of the good things you have done, waiting here patiently just to hear your still small voice again. Holy. Righteous, faithful to the end, Savior, Healer, Redeemer, and Friend, I will worship you for who you are, I will worship you for who you are, I will worship you for who you are, Jesus, I will worship you Thinking of the good things you have done Waiting here patiently Just to hear your still small voice again Holy, righteous, faithful to the end Savior, healer, redeemer, and friend I will worship you for you Oh 
pray together. God, we just thank you for a time that we can come and sing and praise and worship in the name of Jesus. May we open our hearts and minds this morning to the Holy Spirit, that it may enter and dwell in our hearts, God, that we may just, uh, just spend this time just giving praise to the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. Pray in his name. Amen. Close our worship time. We're just going to open up this place for you to come and get on your knees. And, and I just pray that this morning that your heart would be open to the message. The message that God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You come, you pray before your Lord. Highway, a path for the Lord. Cause Jesus. 
Jesus is coming soon. Jesus. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, and let every nation shout of your faith. Yes, Lord. Because Jesus is coming soon.
this waiting time, God. But we actively wait for you, Lord. Because you tarry that none should perish, God. And so we want to be at your kingdom work. And we are honored, God, to be in your presence. God, as we wait, strengthen your people. God, give us a boldness that we've never had before to go forth, to love your people as we've never loved before. God, transform our hearts, renew our spirits. shaken holy there is no one like you 
there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Amen. Thank you, Jason and Emma. I'm going to invite you to stand with me if you can. And uh, let's read God's word here this morning together, uh, starting in Genesis 22 and verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. The sac sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early in the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he carried the firewood and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to the, him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. You may be seated. I am not 80. I just feel that way. No, it is great to be with you, and every year is a gift from God. I'm just thankful to keep having birthdays. Before we begin our message this morning, I'd like for us to spend some time in prayer. We have some folks that need our prayers. Uh, Nancy Grimes in the hospital with her second hip surgery this week. Uh, Dr. Shackelford, who is a part of this service many times, is uh, having surgery tomorrow after receiving burns, and he's having surgery on his legs, so we need to pray for him. Uh, great man of faith. Um, we also have Lisa Berardi in uh, ICU or, um, from the pandemic and struggling, and we need to pray for her and multiple others. You know, we're we are a church who believes in healing. I believe that God is willing to do exceedingly more than we ask or think. And part of the reason we don't get healings is we don't ask for them. So let's go to a time of prayer this morning. Father, you are a great God. You are worthy of our praise and our celebration. We come to you with thanksgiving today that we can gather here, <laughs> unmask, the whole church opened up, we thank you that you brought us through this pandemic. We thank you, Father God, that you are on the throne and 
that though things sometimes seem bleak, you are still on the throne and are going to make everything new. We thank you that you are healing God, and by your stripes we are healed, and I thank you for the greatest healing of all, eternal life through faith in Jesus. But I pray for Nancy and Lisa, pray for Howard, that you would bring healing to them and others who we may not come to our remembrance at this moment, that you'd be near them. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you here today. I thank you that you are working in our church. And I pray, Father, that we would be obedient to your Holy Spirit's leading, that we would not just be hearers of your word, but we would be doers of your word, stepping out in obedient faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I had, uh, I want to thank you all for your prayers, but I had a wonderful experience this week because, you know, I keep telling you that we ought to be praying and uh, struggling with a little bit of pneumonia and some women of the church gathered with me this week in my office and prayed and wow, what a special time of anointing and prayer it was. So let's keep praying for one another. We know someone who's sick, let's go visit them and pray for them. You're here and you're gonna have surgery. You're facing uncertainty in health. Come down front, let's get the elders and pray for you. That's what we're supposed to do. So anyway, that's, that's a separate sermon. Faith tested. James 1, 2 through 4 is an incredible challenge to our faith. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Boy, if you just stopped in that verse there, you'd think, what kind of wacko uh, admonition is that? That I should be happy when I face testings and trials. But you see, you can't stop there. You have to go on and read the rest of it. Because it says, because you know that the testing of your faith develops. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be. Okay, we really trailed off there at the end. I don't know if you picked up on that, but yeah, we want to be mature, complete, not lacking anything. So our faith is challenged to go deeper, to trust him more, to become more like him. Many trials, it says. You see, every one of us will face trials. We don't know what they will be. Your trial may be different than my trial. Your struggle may be different than my struggle. But God is in a perfecting business. In the Bible, you, you may read in your Bibles trials. Some read testing. Some read temptations. The word here is prasmus. And is used to describe things that test people. I don't know if you know this or not, but God is in the perfecting business. He's going to test us. He's going to see if we're strong and show us the areas we need to work on in our lives. Some, for us, some it might be persecution that would come, rejection by friends or family or whatever. Some of you may be facing moral uh, a challenge to be, rise up and become pure in God's eyes and to let go of some failures in your life. Maybe it's a temptation to anger or bitterness. Maybe God is asking you to let go of something that's keeping you from... So these testing and trials come so that we would produce excellence in us. Verse 4 Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. So we must change our paradigm. Now, paradigm is an unusual word, but it means the way we look at something. Instead of saying, whoa, man, I can't believe I got to go through this. This is terrible. This is horrible. We need to change the way we see it and say, okay, God, this is not comfortable. I don't like being stretched like this, but I know you've got a plan, and I want you to make me into the man or woman that you would have me to be. I was at a conference one time or in a session one time, and I, this psychiatrist was talking to us, and he would say, he'd give us a scenario, and he'd say, wow, that's terrible, that's awful awful that's a terrible terrible circumstance but it is livable and I thought yeah so many of the things that God does in our lives that stretch us are uncomfortable they're difficult 
But God is in the perfecting business. He wants you to become more like him. The Christian life is all about a perfecting faith. That, and that should be your attitude. I want my life. As I thought about this, I tried to put it in perspective for myself. I want to be a better husband. Robin says amen. A better grandpa, a better pastor, a better member of this community. How can I better represent God's kingdom wherever he's planted me? In the midst sometimes of horrific, if not difficult, circumstances that we face. Well, Abraham's faith had been being tested regularly as he now begins walking with God. I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your people. I want you to go to a land that I'm not even going to really describe to you, but you're going there, and I'm going to show it to you. And I'm going to build you into a nation when you don't even have kids. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I promise that. So sometime later, Scripture says, <clears throat> Genesis 2, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Number one, it was a test, was a growth point for Abraham. Understand that this test, this growth in faith, always requires, if you want to grow in your faith, a testing. Now, I want to ask you a question here, and how many of you driving a car are thankful that it went through what we call perfecting testing? You know, you, you want to make sure when you drive that car off the lot that it's been tested and its brakes work, <laughs> right? Uh, these new cars, they got so many things on them now. You know, if you're not careful, it corrects itself. I had this car and I'd be driving along and all once it says, you're not driving very good and it take me back, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it even has on my car, it has a thing, wouldn't you like to stop and get a cup of coffee? I mean, how bad is that when the car tells you to get a cup of coffee? I mean, that's pretty bad. But anyway, if there is a perfecting sense of our faith. As God tests us, we are stretched and thereby grow as we respond positively to the calling. Abraham rises to the occasion. The way to increase our faith is to exercise our faith. Test. Now, this testing of Abraham... We know it was a test because the Bible says it was a test. But Abraham didn't know this. For him, it was real time, real life, real faith. How do I respond? He said to him, Abraham, I love this response. Here I am. It's like they lived in this daily commune, this walking together Abraham here I am he replied then the Lord said and boy you talk about a message from God take your son your only son whom you love Isaac and go to the region of Moriah sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you whoa this is a whole different ball game now you know I've read that verse probably hundreds of times growing up and I struggled. I mean, I would just say, oh, yeah, that's really great. Abraham did that until I had children of my own. And I held those little babies in my arms. And I had this vision of what they would grow up to. And then to think, even in the realm of Jesus, that God would send his son to die for a bunch of sinners who don't deserve it. I want to tell you something. When you think about it from that perspective and you're holding your own child, you say, would you send your child? Would you sacrifice your child for those who are undeserving of it, who don't care about it, who are, will be ungrateful for it? Well, Abraham was tested. Abraham's faith was active. The way to increase faith is to exercise faith. To exercise faith is to obey. The call to obedience to the laws and teachings of God in God's word is a repeated concept. If you read through the Bible over and over again, the great saints of God obeyed him. And obedience makes the difference. <clears throat> 
The call to obedience to the laws of God's teaching and word is, is repeated. And, and, and here we have Abraham in an extreme testing. And the reason it's extreme because it becomes a picture for us of what God the Father would do for us in the life of Christ. But maybe for us today, we need to think about the testings and the trials and the temptations that come to us that are meant to be perfecting what is it God may be this morning? We, we think about the big grandiose, but what is it maybe God is saying to you in my perfecting, testing, trials, and temptations? What is it? Maybe it's a besetting sin that you need to let go of. Maybe you need to repent of. Maybe it's a recurrent thing that keeps messing up your thinking and pulling you further away. You know, we all talk about revival, but revival starts when we do the simple things of God, and that's believe his word and obey his word. When we step up to the plate and begin living out the word of God on a daily basis. It's a giving up. Maybe he's calling you to give up some leisure time to be able to serve him. Maybe it's to reach out to someone who has wronged you and love them and be a friend to them and pray for them and encourage them. There's a direct correlation between love and obedience. In John 14, 23 through 24, it says, if any one of you loves me, how many of you love him? Come on now. Raise your hand in shame of the devil. There we go. If any of you, anyone loves me, he will do what? Obey my teaching. My father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. In other words, we will be in relationship, uh, you know, that opening of the door of our heart and teaching, and, and, and he who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So when we think about it, we think, okay, I'm not obeying God's word. I'm not being obedient to the truth. Then we need to ask ourselves transverse, is it true that I really love him? My mother taught me that. She would take me out to discipline me. She usually made me cut my own switch. It was never fun. Never knew whether to get a thick one or a thin one. And I'd say, Mother, I love you. I love you. She says, well, then you better start obeying me. Well, anyway, do you remember the Great Commission? You know, we always think about the disciples and this huge call to go disciple the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then it says, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. As you are going, as you are teaching, as you are preaching, I'm going to be with you. Notice in Genesis 22, 3, early the next morning, God has spoken to Abraham. He's told him what he needs to do. And early in the morning, uh, he early in the morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, took with him his two servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Abraham's faith then grew as he was obedient. Note the three terms within this passage that are within this call of Abraham that are important. Three words, take, go, and sacrifice. Take, go, and sacrifice. The word sacrifice created a word picture for Abraham. It may not be a word picture that we think about because we've never seen it. Do you remember when Adam and Eve sinned against God and they tried to cover themselves with leaves and whatnot? And God said to them, he wondered about their sin and why, and he's talking to him. It says in Scripture, he then covered them with animal skins. It's meant that something had to die to cover them from their sinfulness. And so here we have Abraham being told to sacrifice his son, and that was not an un... That was not a picture that he was not familiar with because he had sacrificed to God before. He'd walked... He'd cut the animals up that God walked between in the great sacrifice. 
Abraham understood that there would be a cutting of the throat. He understood there would be a cutting up of the sacrifice. There would be a burning of the flesh. God was asking Abraham to go against his natural affections, his common sense for his life, his lifelong hope. You see, in Abraham's mind, he was still remembering that this is the son that God said a great nation would come out of. But listen to what it says. He set out for the place God had told him about. Well, see, Abraham just didn't hear the voice of God and begin to act in obedience, but he also took preventative measures. Abraham eliminated any barrier to obedience. You see, this is one of the problems in the Christian faith. We know what we need to eliminate from our lives that keep us from becoming the men and women that God would want us to be, but we're not ready to eliminate it. Abraham eliminated any barriers to obedience. I was telling him in first service, uh, I probably told you this story before, but my mother was struggling with diabetes when she was living, and she's gone now about 16 years. And I was visiting with her one day, and she said, Jerry, I need you to pray for me. I just got to quit eating sugar. I just, I just got to lose some weight. I got to get better. I said, I know, Mom, I just love you so much. She said, I'm, I'm going to help you, Mom. She said, okay. So I went over and got the garbage can, went over the cupboards and started pulling out anything that had sugar in it, throwing it away. Cookies, candies, pop, you name it, I threw it away. Cake mixes. She says, what are you doing? I said, I'm helping you, Mom. Well, no, you're not. You're throwing away good stuff. Good stuff? This is poison to you, Mom. You can't have this. Well, we went back and forth for a while. She never did listen to me. Of course, I don't listen about a lot of things either. No. Abraham removed any obstacles to obedience. Did you notice what it says? On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the mountain, saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. <coughs> he removes the obstacles. One of the obstacles is not mentioned here, but, and that was, Abraham didn't take his wife with him. Because that motherly instinct, that love for that son, would have been preventative. Abraham commands his servants, these men who probably were handpicked because they loved him and they loved his son they walked with him they were his servants he would say to them you stay here he didn't want them going along can you imagine the fuss they would make? can't do this and how they might have intervened he commands the servants stay here with the donkey while i and the boy go over there this was more than just a father and son going to worship, and Abraham knew that he must do this with no hint of interference. He precluded anything that would hinder his obedience to God. And maybe the question we need to ask, is there, are you listening to me? Is there anything in your life hindering your obedience to God? Something that's keeping you from rising to this point to be all that God would have you to be. Well, secondly, he removes the obstacles and then he confesses his trust in God. Did you notice, and sometimes it's the little tiny minute things in Scripture that we've got to have our radar up for to listen to. Notice what he says. We will worship. He's speaking in the plural. My son and I will worship and we will come back to you. It's in the plural. See, I believe Abraham's been re rehearsing those promises out of Isaac, your son, I will raise up a great nation. Well, how's he going to do that if his son's not living? So be able to respond to God in obedience, we need to remember the promises of God. You can't re review them if you don't know them. And part of the reason we're failing as Christians in our walk and we're being 
how would you say, negatively influenced by the world around us is we don't know the Word of God. We don't know enough to get up and shut the TV off because we don't know the Word of God. We're not blocking out those bad signals that come to us from every direction because we don't know the Word of God. It tells us to take our thoughts captive. It calls us to have pure thoughts, holy thoughts. God's Word is vital to our growth in faith. Hebrews 11, as Pastor Brian read it, really captures where Abraham's heart was. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. And even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead and so in a manner of speaking he did receive Isaac back from death because as far as Abraham thought he is dead because I will take his life as God has commanded you see there was no written theology of resurrection he didn't have the Bible here to turn to the passages where Jesus overcomes the grave But what he did have was a great faith and a powerful God who he believed could even resurrect the dead. Abraham teaches his son about faith. Dads, I hope you're listening to me because every day ought to be an opportunity, you uncles, you grandpas, to teach your sons, your daughters about faith. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Now there's great debate about the size of Isaac here. The train must have been steep because they didn't even take the donkey with them. Abraham transfers the wood to Isaac back. And so all at once we catch a vision that this boy has to be a pretty good size to carry the wood up the mountain. The image of this young man carrying the wood for his own sacrifice up this mountain is a vision of what Christ would do as he carried his cross to Calvary for us. It appears he traveled in silence. This is a journey of faith. Isaac, who had only known joy and laughter with his parents, and Abraham was 100 years old when he had his son, Sarah had said of him, God has brought laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who who would have said to Abraham and Sarah that we would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Just being together, I believe, for Isaac was good enough. Just being with his dad. I think it's an incredible picture of a father-son relationship. Just being together, going to worship. He had no idea what lay ahead as they walked up the mount, as they traveled together. But then Isaac breaks the silence. You know, we have a picture of Jesus in silence. Isaiah says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb to the slaughter, as sheep before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. The only one Jesus talked to was the Father in the garden. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father Abraham, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here. Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide for the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two went on together. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went forward. You see, there are four things here that pop out to me. Number one, it was a declaration of trusting God. And ultimately, we have to ask ourselves, do I really trust God? It was a prophecy of the advent of the Christ. God would provide. It was a prayer of faith. God will provide. I believe, as he's telling Isaac this, he's reaffirming in his own life that I believe God is my great provider. Is he yours? It was an example 
for us to follow of trusting in spite of what we see. How many times in my own life I've never really understood how God was going to work things out. Really, actually, I think it's one of the greatest places to be when you don't understand it all and believe that God's going to work it out. You're going to trust him. I remember in grad school, I was poor in Job's turkey. You know what that means? I had have two nickels to rub together. And uh, it was towards the end of the semester, and I had to pay a bill. I didn't know where the money was going to come from. I'd been working my way, doing every odd job. I was like Larry, Daryl, and Daryl, anything for a buck, man. I worked it. You name it, I did it. Uh, anyway, I went home. I was home, and I was breaking. I said, Dad, I got to have some money. And, I'm, you know, he looked at me and said, I'd really like to help you some, but things are really, there's some real uncertainty in Mom and I's life as far as our work. But I remember my dad saying, then I believe God will provide. So there in his room, it took a lot for me to even ask him for money. I didn't do that usually. He said, son, I believe God's going to provide because he's had you there for a reason. So he said, let's just pray. And we knelt beside his bed. My dad unburdened his soul. I unburdened mine. And we got up, said, we got to trust God. Well, the next day I preached at the church and we were headed out. Some family members had went who knew nothing about this. And I was riding in the back seat of their car to go to dinner after preaching. And my aunt reached back over the seat and handed me the exact amount of money I needed. She said, you know, God laid it on my heart that you needed this. God will provide. God will provide provide we must trust him and know that he is the great provider it was an example for us to follow abraham answered god himself will provide and god did provide he's only provided for us for our salvation through the lamb of god the perfect perfect sacrifice this is a picture of what was yet to come. It was a statement to early believers that there's yet one lamb who will redeem us. Abraham, ultimately, oh, ultimate obedience. You know, it's one thing to start out with good intentions. And you know what they say about good intentions? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. It's another thing to live it in ultimate obedience. Jim Elliott was a man who lived that way. You may not be familiar with that name. Jim Elliott was martyred for his faith in 1956 by a primitive Ecuadorian tribe while he was trying to share the message of Christ with them. His journal entry, October 28, 1949, expresses his belief that the work of God before him, that he was dedicated to no matter what God would do, he would do it. Listen to his quote, it's one of the truly great ones in time. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Let me say that again to you. You might want to write that down. Let me say it real slow. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain which he cannot lose. Luke 9, 24 says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. Now is when the rubber hits the road, so to speak. What were those moments like as Abraham built that altar? See, so he watched his son there. And maybe his son is helping him pile up the rocks. One rock, two rocks, three rocks as they piled this up and built... A He'd probably seen his dad do this before. What was it like? That moment he tied his son's hands and then picked his son up in his arms. Did his tears stream down his cheeks as he looked into the eyes of this promised one who had brought such laughter and joy and hope to his life? Did he run his hands through the boy's hair as he did so many nights as he prayed for his son sleeping there? 
It was obvious that Isaac was a strong man because he carried the wood. He could have fought. He could have fought his father off at this point. But a father who totally trusted God had a son who totally trusted him and believed in a God, father who walked with God. Now he has the knife in his hand. His son is trust. He's on the wood. And he put his hand on his chest as he began to make that motion for that strike, that death blow, and feel his son's heart and chest moving up and down. Did his knees buckle? Did his hands shake? And then all at once he hears some of the most sweetest words, words he'll never forget the rest of his life. Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. <laughs> wow, he says it again, here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. For I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. What a testimony of a God who would not spare his own son, but allow him to be the payment for us. God did provide. God provided Abraham the perfect sacrifice. God provided Abraham with a ram. Genesis 22 says Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram, and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. That would be a great place for an amen. Let me read that one more time. Let's do it again. The Lord will provide. And to this day it is set on the mountain of the Lord. It will be provided. I thank God that he has provided the great Lamb of God for me. Maybe you're familiar with these words because God ultimately provided not only this picture of what was yet to come, but he provided the perfect Lamb. Listen to these words out of Mark. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. And there at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When some of those standing heard this they said listen he's calling elijah someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar put it on a staff and offered it to jesus to drink now leave him alone let's see if elijah comes to take him down he said with a loud cry jesus breathed his last the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom and when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. This pagan soldier understood that moment that God had sacrificed his son for us. Let's stand. Father God, I believe there are some here this morning who need to receive the sacrifice of Christ for their life. They don't know if they die today, if they go to heaven. They don't know what they would say to God. They have a hope so mentality. But the only reason any one of us is going to get into heaven is because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the perfect lamb that you did not spare. Though you spared Isaac as a testimony of yet another lamb that would come, you gave your son for us. And I pray that today every man, woman, and child in this room would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their great Savior and that we would have an urgency to share that testimony with others. But Lord, as you're speaking to hearts, let them feel free to come, to pray, to receive you, to quit playing religion and have a new relationship with the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come, I'd love to pray with you. Let it be Jesus, the first name that I call. the 
sacrifice for us. We have our great Redeemer, Savior. Let us walk in that. In Jesus' name we pray.